In the previous videos, we looked at special tests that are used to evaluate whether or not somebody has serious pathologies pertaining to the upper cervical spine. For example, we looked at the vertebrobasilar artery insufficiency tests, which looks at blood flow through the vertebral and basilar arteries that go to the brainstem. We also looked at a couple special tests that are used to evaluate the integrity of the transverse cervical ligaments. Additionally, we need to be concerned about the ALAR ligaments within the upper cervical spine. And so the ALAR ligament stress test is going to evaluate the integrity of those ligaments. Now, when performing the ALAR ligament stress test, there's two big points to understand. Number one is written here. The PT is going to stabilize the spinous process of C2 with a pincer grip. We're going to come back to that in a minute. And then the second big point is that there's three movements that can be used. Those are rotation of the neck, side bending or lateral flexion of the neck, and side gliding or lateral gliding of the neck. The two we're going to be looking at are lateral flexion or side bending and rotation. Okay, We'll look at those individually. So back to this first one. So the patient's going to be in supine. And the PT is going to stabilize the spinous process of C2 with a pincer grip. So you're going to have to lift the neck up. And then I'm actually doing this with my left hand. You can see me reaching under there. And I'm using a pincer grip to hold on to the spinous process of C2. Now, depending on the source, you may see this test taught in seated. It's also taught in supine. By far, the easiest way to conduct this test is in supine. You can, if you really know what you're doing and you really get good at it, you can do it in seated. However, it's much easier to grasp the spinous process of C2 when the patient is on their back. And the reason being is because if the patient's sitting upright, they're having to activate muscles within their neck to, of course, hold their head in position. And when you activate those muscles, it makes it to where it's harder to get to the C2 spinous process. In supine, the patient's head's relaxing on your hands. So it's much easier to get at the C2 spinous process. But also gravity is kind of helping. It's sort of bringing that C2 spinous process down a little bit. So it's much easier to hold on to in this position. And you need to make sure that you have a good grip on that C2 spinous process. As we go through the motions, if you lose that grip, then the remainder of that test is not valid. So make sure you've got a very good grip on that C2 spinous process with that pincer grip. Now, while maintaining that pincer grip stabilization on the C2 spinous process, you're going to passively side bend or laterally flex the patient's neck, as you see right there. So right here, this is as far as I'm getting into lateral flexion when I have the C2 spinous process stabilized. So while I'm stabilizing that C2 spinous process, I'm actually precluding further movement into lateral flexion or side bending. And so normally what should happen is C2 spinous process stabilization should block full range of the given movement, whether it's side bending, rotating, or laterally gliding. What you should then do once you feel like you've gotten all the available range of motion while it's stabilized, you should then release your grip off of the C2 spinous process like I do right there, and try to get more motion. And notice, I get much more side bending range of motion. So this would constitute a negative test because the motion with no stabilization with my hand free is greater than the motion with the stabilization of the C2 spinous process. Okay? This test would be considered positive if when you block the C2 spinous process, or in other words, stabilize it, it did not preclude further side bending. So if I blocked the C2 spinous process and got this degree of lateral flexion, that would be a positive test. I can also do the same thing with rotation of the neck over here. So I'm going to lift the patient's head and support it. And with my left hand over here, I'm exerting that pincer grip on the C2 spinous process. Make sure to get a firm grip. Remember, if you lose that grip while you're doing the given motion, in this case rotation, the rest of the test is no longer valid. You have to maintain that grip on the C2 spinous process. Assuming I have that grip, now I'm going to passively rotate the patient's neck okay, until I get an end feel. So while I have the C2 spinous process stabilized, that's as far as I get into rotation. And then to make sure it's not just a simple limitation in rotation, of course, I'm going to let go of the C2 spinous process and then attempt to get more rotation. And clearly there's more rotation, so that would constitute a negative alar ligament stress test.
So once again, as with the first case, when I block that C2 spinous process or stabilize it, that should preclude full rotation. And so when I let go of the C2 spinous process, that's when I get the remainder of the motion. So a negative test or a normal response is going to be where the motion with no stabilization of C2 is greater than the motion with stabilization of C2. And again, along the same lines, a positive test is going to be when C2 spinous process stabilization does not preclude further movement, in this case, rotation. So if I was blocking the C2 spinous process and I got this degree of rotation, that would constitute a positive Ehler ligament stress test. Now notice that all three of these movements, rotation, side bending, and side gliding, the latter of which I did not demonstrate, has its own set of psychometric properties. For example, if we look at the rotational Ehler ligament stress test, it has a sensitivity of 80% and a specificity of 69%. In fact, notice all three of these movements have a sensitivity of 80%, meaning that no matter which test you do, if it's negative, it means there's an 80% chance that the patient does not have damage or laxity in the alar ligaments. But if we look at the rotational specificity, it's 69%. The side bending or lateral flexion specificity is 77%. And the side gliding or lateral gliding specificity is also 77%. So the specificities are not great. However, Notice that if you perform the Ehler ligament stress test for all three of these movements, you can create a pooled specificity that is improved. In other words, if you perform the Ehler ligament stress test and it's positive in all three of these movements, you now have an 85% probability that the patient does have damage to or laxity in the Ehler ligaments. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.